The next feature we're going to add to our dorm entertainment system is a microphone amplifier. What we have right now is the summing circuit that will add our right and left channels to create a monaural output and we're going to put that then through a power amplifier and play it through a speaker. It would be nice if we could then maybe add in a microphone that we could talk over the music or sing with it or whatever you'd like to do. By adding another resistor to the summing junction, we could connect up a microphone. At the bottom of the page is a drawing of what's called a magnetic or a dynamic microphone. One of the nice properties of this type of microphone is that it just records things that are very close to the mouthpiece of the microphone. What's in the mouthpiece is a magnet and the magnet has a coil wrapped around one of the arms here and that's connected to what's called a diaphragm and as you speak into the microphone you move this cone back and forth and with your voice and that causes this coil to move back and forth in a magnetic field and it produces a voltage or induces a voltage into the coil that matches your sound that's moving this coil back and forth. A simple model for this is just the resistance of the wires that are in the microphone coil. It's something on the order of 50 to 1,000 ohms. For the microphone we currently have in lab, it's around 600 ohms. But the size of the voltages that we're producing are really in the hundreds of microvolts range. So we do need a lot of gain to be able to listen to this. And that's why I had built a gain of 100 into the summing amplifier. And do the same thing for this microphone input. And that's going to see another gain of 11 from the power amplifier stage. So we've got 100 times 11. I also like to maybe make a simple AM radio and also mix that in with our MP3 player if we want to and also our microphone so we could talk over what's coming from off received station. AM broadcast systems put information over the airwaves and the antennas from the transmitter are converting the AC voltages and currents into magnetic waves that are uh, send through space. Take ECE 305 and learn about a transmission line and the antenna really is just that. It's just sending out waves in the air and then if we have the appropriate receiver we can then receive that signal and convert it back to a voltage or a current again. A uh, problem with, with transmitting is that to get the most efficient an antenna you need to have a certain length and so for audio signals the size of the antenna can be uh, astronomical. Antennas work best when they're about a quarter of a wavelength. And a wavelength in free space would be the speed of light divided by the frequency at which you're operating at. So if you had something like on the order of one kilohertz, we're talking about really thousands and thousands of feet of wire. So what typically is done is that we take a higher frequency signal and then manipulate that either by changing its amplitude or its frequency, and that's AM and FM. Kind of illustrate this without a lot of the mathematics. Suppose that I had a radio station, say AM540, and what that really means is that it's transmitting at 540 kilohertz. If you take that signal, just represented as a sine wave, and you multiply that by your audio signal, and this would consist of an amplifier that has a DC level and an AC writing on top of it. I picked 20 kilohertz so you can kind of see what the picture looks like. This is really the upper end of the audio band. But if you were to multiply this times this, we could kind of illustrate that just in spice. We could do it mathematically with trig identities. And if you take ECE 404, actually we'll do that, discuss AM and FM receivers. But here's my signal. I took a 20 kilohertz sine wave offset by 7 volts. And then I'm going to multiply this by a a 540 kilohertz one volt sine wave. And in spice, I can take the product of two voltages and just display what it looks like. And you can see here, here's my 20 kilohertz wave, but it actually shows up twice. And then here's what we call the carrier, which is a much higher frequency tone. And that's how we're going to transmit the signal. So our antenna length would be much, much shorter because we're looking at something on the order of 540 kilohertz instead of something in the audio range. And the problem is we actually got the audio signal twice, so we're going to have to chop off part of the waveform. One way to do that is with a diode. In other words, get rid of one part of this so we just have this particular part of our waveform. So we can make a simple receiver by using a diode, but I don't want a diode with a very large forward drop because what we're picking up off the antenna is extremely small signal. And I found that a silicon diode, I just couldn't do this, so I wound up using it's called a germanium diode. It was actually one of the first diodes that were manufactured using germanium instead of silicon.
The drop across the germanium diode is very small. It's around two tenths of a volt when it's forward bias. If I form a resonant circuit, I can pick up at one frequency a signal off of my antenna, half wave rectify that, and then what's coming out over here then is my carrier transmit signal plus my audio signal. I'll talk about the rest of the circuit in just a minute here. The optimum length for a quarter wavelength would be one quarter the speed of light divided by the frequency that we're dealing with. In this case, it's 540 kilohertz for the receive signal. So it'd be, when you use the speed of light here, you get 234 times 10 to the 6 divided by F. At the bottom of the page is a calculation of the antenna length. It'd be 268 feet of wire. Now, we could have a 268-foot spool of wire in lab, but actually what people do is take a piece of iron material and wrap around it the hundreds of turns of wire to create the length that you need. But again, if this was an audio frequency of like one kilohertz, you could see how long the wire would have to be to be a quarter wavelength. This is where the transmission line actually has its highest impedance, and that's what gives you the best response. But I'll, I'll let other courses talk about that, ECE-305 and also ECE-404, which is our RF electronics class. Now, how does the resonant circuit work? We could think of the antenna as having some Thevenin or Norton equivalent circuit. Shown here is a current source and a parallel resistance, and then I've got an L and a C here. L and C resonate at 1 over 2 pi LC, if you recall that from ECE202. And what's going on at resonance is that the impedance of the inductor is equal to J omega L. So if we were using omega as 1 over the square root of LC, that would make the impedance of the inductor square root of L squared divided by square root of LC, or just L over C. For capacitor, the impedance is minus J over omega C. And again, if we use omega as 1 over the square root of LC, and then think of this as the square root of C squared, then you'd have the square root of L over C. So at resonance, the impedance of the capacitor is the same as the impedance of the inductor, but just the opposite sign. In parallel, you take the product over the sum, but the sum is going to be equal to zero, so that's going to give you an open circuit. So at resonance, all of this current flows into here and creates the largest voltage you're going to see for the received signal. So we can use this to pick up a radio station among many radio stations. If we were tuning AM870, which we're going to try to do in lab, that's again 870 kilohertz or 0.87 megahertz, we could solve for the value of C if we used a 100 microhenry inductor. So we're going to use a variable capacitor in lab, which can vary over a couple hundred picofarads by essentially having fins go in and out of each other. We'll take a look at that when you come to lab, but you can see how the variable capacitor is made. Solving from a frequency of 0.87 megahertz or 870 kilohertz as 1 over 2 pi of square root of LC, I can then solve for C, and it turns out to be about 334 picofarads. So what's coming in then is our carrier signal and the amplitude modulation. We're going to half-wave rectify that, and now put it through an amplifier, where again, I need a lot of gain, because this is a really, really tiny signal. I put a large capacitor here to block any DC from the fact that we're going to half-wave rectify something, so we're going to create an average value. So I'm going to be able to pass the audio band with this value of R and C. We'll do the calculation in just a second on the other page. And then I've got a gain again of about 100. So the signal received here is going to pass through here with a gain of minus 100. It's going to be mixed in with our mixer circuit, which is going to see another gain of 100. And then a power amplifier will see a gain up to 11. So it's 100 times 100 times 11. And I actually need something that big because what's coming in is really, really tiny. Let's do a quick calculation on the value of R and C in that circuit with a capacitor of 10 microfarads in series with this 1K resistor. I then have minus J over omega C. Take the reciprocal of that, you wind up getting 100,000. And if you pull out a factor of, of 2 pi from that, you wind up getting about 16 hertz. So when the frequency is greater than 16 hertz, then this quantity is much, much less than 1K, and so all you see is the 1K resistor. So it's going to be a real high impedance for, for DC, but then once you get above about 16 hertz, what you have then is just literally the 1K resistor. And again, we need very high gain because what we're picking off that antenna is really, really tiny. So what's coming out of the op now is just the audio 
amplitude modulation, and the carrier signal. Now we mentioned in the last lab that op amps have a gain bandwidth product. And so if you had a gain bandwidth product of a million and you have a gain of 100, then you're talking about an upper bandwidth of 10 kilohertz. So that's why I picked gains of 100 in these stages is that I could pass things up to 10 kilohertz. Come out of the op amp, our first stage is the gain of 100 times the audio signal, but then the gain is going to fall off with frequency. The 540 kilohertz signal we talked about initially, or in this last example, 870 kilohertz signal, he's going to see a very, very small voltage out from the first stage of the op amp. And in successive op amp stages, we'll even make it smaller. So all we're going to see or here at our output is just the AM signal that we picked up. So again, this is lab 11. It's called a dorm entertainment system. We're making a CD or MP3 player power amplifier, public address system, ability to take a microphone and be able to speak through a speaker, mix everything together or not. You could sing along with music if you wanted to, and then building a simple AM radio. But we build a much more sophisticated one, an ECE 404, using what's called a super heterodyne receiver. The concepts that we're covering are a current limit of an op amp, a class B amplifier, crossover distortion, mixing, parallel resonance, and AM modulation and detection. And we're going to learn how to measure efficiency in lab. And this is lab 11, the dorm entertainment system.